have it switched on. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. My name is Pat Langhorn. I'm from the University of Otago in New Zealand. And along with Greg Leonard and my colleagues, uh, Wolfgang Rack, Gemma Brett, and Dan Price, they are also from New Zealand, from the University of Canterbury. Christian Haas is from AVI in Germany. Stefano Arbini is from the National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in Italy. And then Alex Fraser and Pat Wompan are from the Australian Antarctic Programme Partnership. Together, we are all Antarctic land pass sea ice experts, enthusiasts, enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel a wee bit of a fraud here because what I want to talk about are two things. One is an upcoming review of Antarctic past ice. And the second is some observations that we made recently on Antarctic fast ice thickness. So what is fast ice? Fast ice is ice that's held stationary by the coastline, by the seaward edge of floating ice tongues or ice shells or by grounded icebergs. It's usually less than a couple of hundred kilometers wide. And so if we look around Antarctica, which this nice map made by Alex Fraser that has shows, you can see it's just kind of like an eyeliner around the coast of Antarctica. So it only occupies 7% of the total Antarctic sea ice cover in summer and less when it's at its maximum in the winter, 3%. Generally, it's first year ice but there is some little bit of multi-year ice. Now, turns out that it's been known about for some quite long time, and Wright and Priestley, who went south with um, Scott on the ill-fated 1910 expedition, already recognized that the role of icebergs were pretty important for fast ice. The Soviet work in the 60s and 70s recognized that bathymetry was important and that there were a variety of ice types that you might find on in, within the fast ice. But it's only in 2021 that we have published a continuous high spatial tempor temporal resolution time series of circum-Antarctic fast ice yeah. extent, thanks to Alex Fraser. And so that's shown on the bottom two panels with the climatology on the right hand side. It's only for the 21st century. So it's only from March 2000 to March 2019, 2018. And you can see already that things are not exactly as expected because the fast ice is maximum in September, October rather than later for um, the entire fast, it's sea ice cover around Antarctica. Now, given that we're so recently finding out about fast ice, should this, um, is it just because there's nothing very interesting to know? Does it matter? In other words, should we care? And obviously I think we should. Um, fast ice buttresses the ice on the land. So it keeps, the stuff on Antarctica that needs to stay there or will all be swamped. Um, and as an illustration, I show this, some pictures from this recent paper of the fracture of the Parker ice tongue in the Western Ross Sea. Um, the authors showed that when there was a summer decrease in fast ice, that ice tongue flowed 11% faster than when it was surrounded by fast ice in winter. So fast ice buttresses the ice on the land. Here we're looking underneath fast ice and looking upwards, we can see it's all brown and messy. And that's because there's high primary productivity there. So this fast ice also acts as a nursery for various fish species. 
and charismatic megafauna also rely on fast ice. These Weddell seals use it for breeding and calving in the summertime. Emperor penguins also rely on fast ice for their colonies. And in fact, if coastal fast sea ice and the critically fast ice disappears, then we are told that emperor penguin colonies will be quasi extinct by 2100, according to um, climate models predictions. In spite of that importance, there are, maybe not too surprisingly, given we've only just know, found out what the extent is, there are very many gaps in our knowledge. And I just want to pick on three. Um, one, because they interest me, and the other two are because they might interest you. So the first one is the thickness distribution. Virtually nothing is known about the thickness distribution of Antarctic sea ice and definitely not fast ice. Um, satellite remote sensing often ma uh, masks out the edge of the continent because it causes problems with tidal models and there isn't enough open water to get a signal for satellite altimetry. So our thick knowledge of thickness distribution tends to be just some local stations, national stations, or logistical hubs. We might know a lot about what's happening there. So that's my first point, and I'm going to come back to it. The second one, ice, uh, sorry, wave ice interaction, of course, the modeling started with fast ice because it's nice flat cover um, and simple to model. But what's still not known is how extensive this is as a decay mechanism, so wave breakup of fast ice, how extensive is it as an Antarctic-wide phenomenon? And how is it influenced by all the things that go on outside? So the understanding <coughs> of the wave ice modelers could be uh, very well employed by those of us interested in Antarctic fast ice. And thanks to Elizabeth, who mentioned this morning, um, fast ice is only just coming into climate models at all. And the two Libya studies there are Arctic. The only one I know of, maybe somebody knows of more, the only one I know of in Antarctica is the Van Acher et al. study, um, looking at fast ice in East Antarctica around the Totten Glacier. And the way that it's modeled in this case is to put in an iceberg and then have a tensile string, put in icebergs, sorry, grounded iceberg, and then allow tensile string to be factored around that. There are many ways in which these models could be improved, perhaps for understanding of biochemical um, processes, but there are things in Antar that are Antarctic specific that would be really nice to have in models. Start things like snow ice formation, because there's a lot more snow around Antarctica than in the Arctic. Frazzle or sugar, which is like big frazzle. So frazzle are little crystals that stick together. Sugar is big bits that stick together. So the influence of wind and waves on that, there is interaction between the sea ice and the ice on the land above the surface through polynias and coastal currents and then also below the surface. So these kind of factors might be real nice to be thinking about in modeling. So I want to return to fast ice thickness. And this is a little hint of the gadget we're going to be using there. Um, there it is. We need to think about the factors that are important in 
model in uh, shaping the thickness of Antarctic fast ice. First of all, there's the obvious thermodynamic processes um, that are going on around the coast. There'll be snowfall on the surface and the transformation to snow ice. And in some places, the ice cover is entirely snow ice. There is, as I've said, the presence and absence or absence of shelter from grounded icebergs, coastal features, winds, currents, and the dynamics that go with moving that ice around. There's the interplay between coastal polynias, near shore current, and coastline, and then very Antarctic specific, the interaction with ice shelves, ice tongues, and icebergs. What I want to do is explore some of these factors within a survey within the Western Ross Sea. Now, why the Western Ross Sea? Well, most importantly, it's because that's where I can get to. But that's still a good place to look at these uh, factors. What's up here is the first ever mapping of Antarctic fast ice. Whoops, and it slipped a bit. Um, Antarctic fast ice that came from Wright and Priestley in 1922. And beside it, I've put the Fraser et al mapping and actually Wright and Priestley did a stunningly good job in 1922. I'm sorry, something bad has happened there. We're going to conduct the first regional fast ice thickness survey in the same region. Now, just to give you some ideas of some of the factors that are going to be important in this survey, let me just pick out this little rectangle here. And we'll imagine we're on a plane, an airplane looking out the window flying southwards, right? So this is what you would see from the window of that plane. Here we have a large body of ice that has come from the land, Rygalski Ice Tongue. It is blocking uh, the flow of ice that is moving northwards with the coastal current. And it's also influenced by howling gales coming off the land to open up this water here in the Terra Nova Bay Polinia. We've got pack ice out here, and I'm ashamed to say I could only find a tiny little bit of fast ice. So what I want to point out, though, are these streaks of frazzle on the ocean surface, which are a dominant factor of this kind of area of Antarctica. And they don't just exist around the surface of the water. They are also caused by ice-ocean interaction at the base of the ice shelves. So Deep in the ocean, the uh, sort of glacial features like the Drygalski ice tongue are also influencing um, the sea ice because, because of basal melting at the base of ice shelves and ice tongues, we can form supercooled water in what we call ice shelf water because it has interacted with an ice shelf. When that water rises to the ocean surface, it will become super cool. We get tiny frazzle crystals in it that then float up to the base of the ice. And here we're looking at the bottom of the sea ice cover. That's um, for scale here. And we see these higgledy piggledy crystals that form a mushy, slushy layer at the bottom called the sub ice platelet layer. And that layer can be quite thick. So close to the ice shelf, it might be seven meters thick under just a couple of meters of sea ice. And the older the ice, the thicker that layer might be, it can be up to 11 meters thick. Okay, 
So we're going to want to be able to resolve that porous subice platelet layer beneath the ice, as well as the ice thickness. So the tool we use is this little fella here. She's called Rosie. Rosie is an electromagnetic induction device. And she is well proven. She's here slung under the belly of a 1943 DC3. She can measure level and consolid sorry, level consolidated ice plus snow thickness to plus and minus 0.1 meter. So she's pretty accurate, providing you have level ice. If you have unconsolidated ridges or a rubble field, then she's likely to underestimate the thickness. So keep that in mind because all our measures are likely to be underestimates. So what happens is the aircraft takes off and there she is, she gets lowered down so that she flies about 15 meters above the ice surface. And here she is um, over land fast sea ice, as you can see. She will measure the sum of the snow plus ice thickness, and she cannot resolve these two. She measures the sum of these ice thickness, and I will be lazy and just call it the ice thickness, sorry. And we're going to want to pick out the sub-ice platelet layer as well. So we need to think about how she's doing that. Um, here's a, a sketch of how she does it. She's essentially sensing the conductivity of the ground below her. So she, in the simple case where she's on ice over water, the nearest conductive medium is the seawater. She can sense that distance or it's calibrated. She also has a laser on board, so she measures the snow surface, subtract one for the other, hey presto, you've got your answer. So here's, ah, sorry, yes, I will come back. No, that's, that's the, a uh, bit complicated. Um, it, yes, in that simple picture, I meant the consolidated ice. I'll come back to that. Okay, so, oh dear, sorry, something gone wrong with this figure too. Never mind. Um, this was a sea ice thickness survey that we completed in November 2017, in the springtime when the ice was very close to its maximum thickness. We covered about 4,000 kilometers over fast ice and pack ice. And the pack ice work has already been published. So these lines, the red and the yellow and the green and the blue are all the survey, um, survey coordinates. And we're up here in the Ross Sea. So although it's 4,000 kilometers, it is of course diddly squit in terms of Antarctic coverage. Um, the first result I wanted to put up here, and I'm sorry, I've lost the color somehow from the, from the histograms, is that the fast ice is thicker than the pack ice. So the pack ice mode was 0.2 or one and a half, depending on which one you took. And it had a mean of well, two meters thick. The fast ice, on the other hand, had a mode of almost two meters and a mean of 2.7. Now to get back to Gray's question here. We want, though, to also resolve this sub-ice platelet layer. And so we're not just dealing with two conductivities, zero and seawater, we've also got something in between. And the sub-ice platelet layer is, has a very um, poorly known conductivity, and it's, I think, impossible to know it. Um, but it lies between the conductivity of the snow plus ice, air, everything above, and the seawater. So we are going to use a three-layer model to try and pick out these, um, this layer. We only have a single frequency 
EM. So we have two unknowns. Well, we have two measurements. We have the in phase and the quadrature measurements. And it turns out we're going to have to deal with the level ice differently from the rough ice. We are only going to be able to resolve the sub ice platelet layer under level ice because under rough ice, the blockiness traps liquid, which causes a porous layer. So we have no chance of resolving the small layer porosity from the larger. So we're going to use a simple model to get sub-ice platelet layer thickness, but only under level ice. So we're going to have to distinguish our level fast ice from our rough fast ice if we're going to be able to, to do this. So this is a, a sketch of how we um, separate the two quantities and the measurements we have. So along the top here, we have a photo mosaic taken looking downward, right? So we can see that we're going from ice shelf to level ice to rough ice out to very thin pack ice. Underneath, I've plotted thickness being measured downwards against distance from the ice shelf. We use a thickness algorithm, which basically takes a, a smooth thickness gradient onto which we apply a threshold. And using that algorithm, we would distinguish this as levelized, this is rough, and then this is level. In the levelized, we use the quadrature as our measure of consolidated ice. And under rough ice, we use the in phase. Now, the reason is that when we have this porous layer, the quadrature and in phase thicknesses separate by an amount that we can use to calculate the sub ice platelet layer thickness. The vertical lines uh, just show the separation between the level and rough ice according to our algorithm and also according to the photographs and they agree fairly well. Okay, so let's look at some results. On the left here, we have a SAR image on which I have plotted the thickness. And thickness is going from the yellowy colors, which are sort of less than a meter up to red, which is between eight and 10 meters. We also got wider lines are level ice and the thinner lines are for the rough ice. So within 30 days of its maximum extent, so probably at maximum thickness, this is a sort of overall plot of what the thickness is in the Ross Sea. Uh, modal snow plus ice thickness is 1.9 and the mean is 2.6. Okay, so what? Let's break that down a bit. Our flights went over 59% level ice by length. We can also sort of integrate the volume in the level or rough ice category and, sorry, integrate the thickness. And that's what I'm going to call volume. It's not really volume. So it turned out that in the Western Ross Sea, about 50% by volume is level ice. So half rough, half level. The level ice certainly looks as though it's thermodynamically grown with a mode of two meters, just exactly what we'd expect. And the sub ice platelet layer um, is very small, only just above our error. Um, but this kind of hides the fact that in some locations, the sub ice platelet layer is 10 meters thick. So it's very variable. 
The rough ice, as shown on the left-hand side here, is complementary, 41% by length, 50% by volume, has a much greater mean uh, and mode of over two meters. But the main point of this whole project was, of course, to look at the processes involved in fast ice thickness. And so I want to home in on just some of the areas. Um, this is the most southern region. At the bottom here is the McMurdo Ice Shelf. And I've put in an arrow to roughly indicate where the cold coastal current that emanates from the McMurdo Ice Shelf is flowing northwards. In this area, the sub-ice platelet layer is quite dominant. This is the plot now, this is a plot of sub-ice platelet layer. The greens are not significant, but the blues are where there is something over half a meter. And I think the things to see here is that there is actually quite a lot of it. And in addition, it's thicker close to the coast. Not a big surprise really, because there is also some evidence of local sources, things like there appears to be some, there could be some double diffusive effects because of um, aquifer entry from this area of where there is known to be some subsurface, very dense brines. So this sub-ice platelet layer in this case may come from um, the McMurdo ice shelf. But the place that gets the prize for the most stunning sub-ice platelet layers is this little ice shelf here, this Hell's Gate ice shelf. And once again, there are three transects uh, with ice thickness going from zero to 10, yellow to red. And I've also plotted them out as a function of distance from the ice shelf going A to B, C to D, E to F. And there's three regions, right, that are quite clear. There's thin level ice with a substantial sub-ice platelet layer, like 10 meters. Then outside of that, there's a thick rubble field. And then out into the pack ice. So what's going on here? We looked at the satellite images. And what uh, we could identify was that there is a thickness, uh, ru this rubble field here came into place just days after the fast ice close to the ice shelf in this area was starting to form. So normally when this rubble field is not there, it just blows out. That means that this ice in here grew extremely fast. There was 1.1 meter of fast ice and then three and a half meters of sub-ice platelet layer below it. And that requires huge heat transfer to the ocean or ice crystals coming in and to the atmosphere. Finally, just looking to the north of our survey where there's rough ice, in this case, what's happening is that the coastal currents are pushing the ice against the coast. And we find that there are places where it's five meters thick and places, there's a two kilometer region where it's over eight meters thick. All right, so in conclusion, we see that fast ice thickness is influenced by the presence of ice shelf water and by the presence of polynias. The fast ice was thicker than the adjacent pack ice in this particular survey. Sub-ice platelet layers over three meter, half a meter thick were present under a lot of the level ice. And so the processes that would be great to have modeled are some of these drivers of fast ice thickness. Thinking about wave penetration and breakup of fast ice in the coast and then additional parameterizations in addition to the grounded icebergs and tensile strength. Thank you.
Thank you, Pat. Um, do we have any questions um, now? Um, Pat's we've got time for one or two. Um, so you're just definitely over there. Hello, Pat. Uh, does this play that they are get consolidated at some point? I beg your pardon. Uh, does it this platelet layer does it get consolidated at some point, or it stays like these loose crystals? Does it get consolidated? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes. Sorry, uh, I should have explained it better. It. Um, we believe that most of the sort of mushiness comes from the ocean, but there is heat transfer all the time upwards to the atmosphere, and so it as atmosphere continues to cool the consolidated ice will get thicker and thicker growing into the sub ice platelet layer is that your question yeah yes yeah. um maybe one more question um go to um yeah. thanks pat really nice presentation thanks um maybe two questions what, what do you think is explains the roughness of the uh, rubbled ice that you uh, so because it looked like it was not like linear ridges but instead just a just a thickening, mess. yeah just so. a big mess yeah. yes exactly um i think it's probably uh the polynyas have a lot to do with it very very unpleasant places of course and so the ice is getting all uh pushed around um the reason i mean polynyas you generally think they push offshore, push the ice offshore. But what happens, we believe, is that this ice gets pushed offshore, it's all jumbled up. And then the coastal current carries it up to push it against the coast. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, here we are. I'll just go back. So push it up. So the Terra Nova Bay Polinia is down here. It would push rubble on into this area and then that drifts north to get smashed against this coast here. Okay, so, so we think these very thick regions are cases of old flows. So it may not be first year flows, but it's frozen into a cover that has been there less than a year. Okay. Yeah. What do you think explain those like a really high um, atmosphere or like ice atmosphere heat flux? Is it that there's a, a valley there, there's high catabatic winds or why oh. is such large heat flux? Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, what we think happened is the rubbly ice got into place. It held the little area of level fast ice in place. There was then very cold water comes from under the ice shelf quickly makes a four and a half meter layer that, well, there's four and a half meters initially of some kind of frazzle ice mixture. Mm -hmm. And then because there are high winds coming off the Hell's Gate ice shelf all the time, they push the snow off the surface as the photographs would show. So there's a very, a uh, rapid heat transfer to these freezing foul winds that are just coming careering off the glacier um, upwards through sea ice that essentially has no snow cover on it. That would be our explanation. Um, I think there are a few more questions, but I think we probably have to move on. Um, but if you, I'm sure there'll be opportunity, hopefully, to, to if you have any more questions, chat to Pat in the coffee break um, and any of the other speakers. Um, Yep, so thank you again, um, Pat, for that very interesting talk. Sorry, Pat, I was no, 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 that... um, And next we um, have Ian Eisenman, so um, when he's ready, um, he can take over. Yeah, I'll take that now. Yeah, and we need that out. <laughs> that goes. Uh, that is... Uh -huh.